Pardon. So I realize now with this microphone on, like I'm waiting and I've got like this nervous like hmm, but like everybody can hear the hmm. Like, mm. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, as part of the worship songs and some of the things we've already been talking about, we're going to be talking about uh, faith today. Uh, and we're also going to be talking about a storm, too, above all things. And it's wild, right? It's, it's amazing. That's how the Lord works. We've got a storm going on outside. Uh, the Oxford Dictionary, in case you guys were wondering, describes faith as complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Now, we, whenever you read a, a definition, it usually has a sentence, like it uses a word in context, and the, the, the sentence that they use was, it said, I have complete faith in our politicians. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what it said. I... Uh, but there's, there was also a second definition. The second definition said, uh, is a strong belief in God based on spiritual understanding rather than proof. Now, you guys have all exercised some measure uh, of faith today. Just to give you an example, um, uh, those of you guys that drove here, you guys got in your vehicles, you turned the key, you had faith, like, this car's going to turn on, it's going to get me to Dunklin'. As you guys are driving down the road to Dunklin', you're, you have faith that all these people on the other side of the road, they're going to stay on their side of the road. You guys are operating in a measure of faith. When you got dressed this morning, you had faith that all those s'mores you ate over there at the campfire last night wasn't going to affect size of you pulling up your pants today. You had faith that your clothes were going to fit you as you put those clothes on today. And I see uh, pretty much everyone sitting in a chair today. You guys exercise some faith without even knowing it by sitting in your chair. Now I didn't see everyone come in and say, Ooh, okay, this one looks sturdy. Size it up. Yeah, that, I can totally hold my weight. And then have a seat. Have a seat. You guys exercise faith without even thinking about it, sitting in your chair. It didn't matter how you felt about the chair. You could be super mad at the chair or disagree with the chair or disagree with the color, but you still exercise faith and sat down. So the same is also up, true of the opposite. Say you had faith and trusted that this chair would really hold your weight, but you just decided you were going to stand right here for the whole service. Like, I know the chair can do what it said it's going to do, but I'm just going to stand here instead. That's how we treat God sometimes. We say, God, I know you can do these things, but... I can really do them on my own. I don't necessarily need your help. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Now I'm going to say that same sentence a few different ways throughout the service today, but faith is acting like God is telling the truth. God is telling the truth in all these words in this book. I believe that God is telling the truth. I have faith in His Word. So what do we put our faith in? We can put our faith in a lot of different things other than the Lord. Um, like the first definition that I read to you guys, politicians. Some of you guys put all your faith in politicians that uh, President Biden is going to work out all of our troubles and we're not going to have any issues. Some of you put your faith in him. Some of you put your faith in science and technology and this phone that I have. I believe this phone is going to get me out of jam. When I get in trouble, I'm just going to Google up the solution and figure out. Some of you put faith in those things, things that don't matter. Some of you put faith in your own talents and abilities that whatever trouble you get in, that you can get yourself out. We've all done that. Um, you know, my children, often they get in trouble. They're five now and three. Uh, so they'll get into a situation and uh, often I'll sit back and allow them to work it out. I don't necessarily jump in there, right, and fix the problem that they have or they wouldn't learn anything. And sometimes God does that with us, uh, giving us an opportunity to grow. And in Luke 18, 17, it says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So what does this mean? I hear a tornado warning going off. Storm outside. We're going to be talking about the storm in just a little bit. But faith like a child, what does that mean? Faith like a child. Can't go this way. It's raining. Faith like a child. So uh, my son just turned five a few weeks ago, and we decided that we wanted to surprise him for the weekend. We were going to pick him up from school and take him to Legoland for a night uh, and a day. So uh, 
uh, my, I took Friday off and went and picked them up and me and my wife we got them in the car and it was about time to tell them what we're going to do and my wife's like, well, you tell them. And I'm like, no, you can tell them. So she tells them and the look on his face, I've never seen such an expression. I thought he was going to explode. He was so excited. It was like, ah. <laughs> But see, the thing is, is that we, at that moment, we were not in, we, were, we weren't even at Legoland. We just told him what we were going to do. But he believed that we were going to do what we say we were going to do. He believed that we were going to take him to Legoland. He believed that with everything in him. And much the same way we need to believe in God. You know, what are some of the promises that he's spoken to you guys in the program or in your lives? What are some things that he's spoken to you? Do you believe that he's going to do what he says he's going to do? The Lord has spoken many promises to me throughout my time here. Uh, healing, restoration, wife, children, family. These are all promises that the Lord has spoken to me that he has answered in my life. Now, few years back I was having some medical problems uh, I I don't know I, I had like some heaviness and feeling like on my left side and uh, one day it was like my face my lip was kind of drooping down and uh, I remember going to the emergency room and they, they couldn't really find anything referred me out and then uh, I also had uh, a couple times there were these bouts where I would get uh, where I would just start laughing like not like laughing like Dave Garden tells a joke and you have like this little chuckle, but like full on like belly laughing. Like I can't catch my breath laughing so hard. Now I was having a, a disagreement with my wife one day, and then one of these things came on where I just started laughing. But needless to say, it diffused the argument that we were in. Uh, there was nothing funny about it. So one day uh, I come home after work. It's fr Friday night. And I you know after we have this conversation. You know, this is before kids, so Megan was pregnant at the time. And I asked her, so what do you want to do? Uh, what do you want to do for dinner? She's like, oh, well, we go to the chow hall. Well, what do they have in the chow hall? Okay, uh, sloppy joes. Okay, that sounds good. Let's go do that. Then the next minute, I say, hey, what do you want to do for dinner? And then she notices my speech is getting slurred. And my lips drooping down a little bit more. And she says, we just had this conversation. You don't remember? I'm like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So she's like, all right, we're going to the ER. So we went to the ER. And I get in there, and they put me in a wheelchair, hook me up to the machines, and then all I know is I go out. I don't know what happened. And then I woke up, and I hear them calling stroke alert, and they've got like five or six different people working on me, doing these tests and asking me questions, and it was, it was, quite, it was quite an ordeal. Uh, so after that, they determined that I didn't have a stroke. Uh, so. I stayed in the hospital and said, well, all right, we're going to run some more tests and kind of see how you're doing and uh, monitor you for a day or two. So within that day or two, I had, and so it was Friday night, so Saturday, uh, a lot of, I had a lot of people that were on staff here from the hospital come visit me and, you know, pray for me, pray for healing. But I can honestly say, in that moment, in those moments of knowing the Lord and going through all that, I had all my faith in the doctors. Like, I'm waiting for the doctors to say, okay, this is what's wrong with you here. Take this pill or uh, go exercise some more and do this and then, and then you'll be good. I had all my faith in that. So, I left the hospital. Every test that they, every test that they had undergone, I left the hospital without any answers. They said, all right, we'll follow up with a neurologist. So, here I am leaving, uh, leaving the hospital. Uh, so I'll come back to that story a little bit later. So today we're going to be looking at Matthew, uh, verse four, excuse me, chapter 14, verse 22. Uh, we're going to start there, and we're going to be talking about talking about a storm. Peter and a storm. Like I said, there's a storm outside. Lord, you. Know. So starting at verse 22, it says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. I'm sorry. Uh, up until this point, uh, Jesus has, has fed the 5,000 people, so he's performed some miracles, so now he's sending, sending the disciples ahead of him. So uh, Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray, and later that night he was there alone. So a few things to notice uh, in that is that Jesus knew the importance of prayer. Jesus knew the importance of quiet time. 
you know, I don't know how many times we have guys that come back to the program and we ask them, well, how was your quiet time? And that's the first thing that goes to quiet time. So Jesus knew the importance of that and the importance of spending solitude with the Lord. So Jesus sent disciples out ahead of them. In verse 24 it says, And the boat was already considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Now, reading the same story in Mark 6, uh, Mark 6, verse 48, it says, He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. So there they are, there they are three or four miles out, uh, out from shore. Uh, and another verse, it says, it was the fourth watch. So the fourth watch is between 3 and 6 a.m. So this is like really early in the morning. They've been out uh, probably all night. So they're fighting against the storm, straining. There's wind. Uh, wind waves and they're and they're growing they're just growing but they're not going anywhere so uh, they're definitely dealing with a lot of emotion at this point I can imagine if we gave them their journals the next day and say all right I want you to journal on your attitudes from what you experience uh, out there on the storm I imagine they would have a lot to share uh, and say with the Lord on the negative side so remember at verse 22 uh, Jesus told them to go there Jesus told them to get in the boat and go ahead of them. So do you think Jesus knew there was going to be a storm? Knew that they were going to be walking into the storm or rowing into the storm? Was it a test of faith that they needed to walk through? Now Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So He is the one that gives it to us. He is the one in whom we have faith in and He is the one that perfects it. Well, how does He do that? How does He perfect our faith? Through tests, through trials. We will walk through difficult times in this life. There is no question about it. There will be tests, trials, accidents, tragedies in our life, but what are we going to do through those tragedies? We have to expect the testing of our faith. It says if and when we will face trials and tribulations. Not, excuse me, it says when, when and whenever we face trials and tribulations, not if. It is going to happen. The world is going to be against us. But through those trials, He's going to build our confidence and faith in Him if we continue to keep our eyes on Him. Now we're going to keep on reading. In verse 25 it says, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw Him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. So now they see. Now they believe to see what is a ghost. So mind you, all this other stuff is going on. They're facing the storm and not going anywhere, and wind and rain and terrified. And uh, now they see this ghost. But Jesus immediately said to them, "Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid." Now it says Jesus immediately responded to them. So they're sending out requests, and then Jesus immediately responds to them. You know, I would have to say if it were me, like I'm some can be somewhat of a prankster, like so I would maybe like wait a few more minutes to respond and maybe like would be a little bit scared, but but Jesus is not me, so Jesus immediately respond, immediately responded to them. He said, Take courage in his eye. Verse twenty eight it says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell them to come tell me to come to you on the water. So after after seeing Jesus walking on the water, Peter requested him requested to come out there with him. So Peter believed that being out there with Jesus, walking on the water, was safer than where he was at in the boat. In verse 29 it says, Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water. Now there will be times that we'll be in that same situation, unable to see the shore, out in the middle of the storm, be in an impossible situation where there's no way out. There's no way that we can see that we can get out of whatever trial uh, that we're going through. Now you never know how many lives you'll impact on this earth by being obedient in faith. He said, "Come," and he did. He came out of the he came out of the boat. One day there was a plane flying. West Palm to Dallas, and it was the middle of the night, and there was a storm. Sound familiar? No. There was a storm, 
and people are on the plane and they're hitting a lot of turbulence and the plane's going up and down and doing a couple free falls and everybody on the plane is panicked. They're like calling their loved ones, saying their goodbyes, like, listen, this is it. I don't, I don't think we're going to make it. I love you so much. And then there's this little boy in seat 3, 3B. He's playing with his trains. And the lady sitting next to him in disbelief is like, how could you be sitting here playing, playing with trains while all this stuff is going on with the plane? And he says, my dad's the pilot. My dad's the pilot. I knew he's flying the plane. We'll be all right. So who's flying your plane? Is Jesus the one in the cockpit? Is Jesus the one controlling? Is he the object and source of your faith? Continue reading, it says, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sing and cried out, Lord, save me. So Peter's out on the water and then, and then he starts to get scared. He starts to look at the wind. He starts to look at the obstacles that are around him rather than focusing on the Lord and, and how he even got there. Second, he cried out, Lord, save me. How many of you guys have cried that same, that same prayer right there? I mean, that was a prayer right there. Lord, save me. I mean, I don't know. I don't know about Peter. I don't know if he knew how to swim. Maybe he didn't know how to swim. Maybe he got out, and that was a potential life and death situation that he was in. Lord, save me! You know, I had that same prayer one month before I came to Dunklin. Lord, save me! We also can't miss the greater spiritual truth, and that we cannot save ourselves. We are in need of a Savior. We need to believe in Jesus Christ and believe He has come to this earth and died for our sins and, and, and then rose and put our faith in Him. And that we can't do it by our own works, by, our, by ourselves. We need a Savior. When Peter cried out, Lord, save me, he fully believed that the Lord was going to save him where he was at. He had put all his faith in him. Or he wouldn't have asked. Lord, save me. He had faith in the Lord in spite of his circumstances that the Lord was going to do what he said he was going to do. Do you believe in the same way? Do you believe that the Lord's going to do like we, we sit and we stand and we ask for prayer and we pray for healing and we do all these things? Do you believe that he's going to do those things? I hope so. I hope you believe in all your heart that he, and have faith in Him that He's going to do these things. Verse 31, it says, Immediately Jesus reached out His hand and caught Him. You of little faith, He said, why did you doubt? Now Jesus caught Peter in the same way He catches most of us. Saving His life. Now, uh, it didn't say that He didn't have any faith. It said, you of little faith. So I imagine if, you know, I play games, video games with my son often, so I imagine if he had like this face meter next to him, like this big green bar, and he's like, sees Jesus out in the water, and he's like, okay, there's the Lord, all right, I'm going to get out. Oh yeah, all right, thank you, Lord, I'm walking on water, I'm performing a miracle. Oh, look at the wind. Oh, oh, it's raining, oh, that's a lot of wind. And his, and his faith starts to deplete. Now, we can often be in the same way. Starting a difficult challenge or task and say, Oh, God, I believe in you. I believe you're telling me to step out in faith and start this ministry or do whatever it is the Lord's telling you to do. And then one obstacle comes your way and then you're focused on that rather than the Lord. And the one who said, Get out of the boat. Come do what I'm asking you to do. I said it before and I'll say it again. You never know how many lives will be impacted on this earth and in heaven by you being obedient to what God is asking you to do. Now, we often use this example uh, a lot, but Brother Mickey coming out in the middle of the middle of the swamp, pitching a tent. Who knew? The Lord did. Look how many lives are changed by His obedience, one man's obedience to what God's asking you to do. So what's the Lord asking you to do? Verse 32, it says, When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and then those who were in the boat worshipped Him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. So Jesus climbed into the boat, and everything changed. The storm was gone. Truly you are the Son of God. 
their comprehension of Jesus and who he was started to grow. Now, at this point, they had already seen him perform the miracles. They had already seen him doing all these things. But in that moment, through that storm, through that challenge, they, they said, truly, you are the Son of God. You know, back to the story I was sharing before about going to the hospital. Um, after I...
Is your faith in God? Or is your faith in somebody else? That's the question. You know, some of the songs, they kind of alluded to it uh, about keeping your eyes focused on the Lord. Where are your eyes focused? Are they focused on the challenges and the difficulties that you are going through? Or are they focused on, focused on Him? That really is the challenge that I have for you guys today. What, what are you focused on? Is your faith in the Lord or something else that's going to let you down? Because He's not going to let you down. Well, that's all i got for you guys today. I'm going to pray for us and ask yourself that question today. Where's your faith?